Hey everyone, thanks for coming out. Uh, hello, hello. Thanks for coming out to Apple Source Soho tonight. Uh, it's a Monday night, and I appreciate everyone stepping out for a conversation with my friend Ryan Babazian from founder and CEO of Greats. For those unfamiliar, Greats is a Brooklyn born footwear brand founded in 2013 with the sole desire of providing the men's fashion and lifestyle market with an exceptional high quality shoe at a fantastic price, well below, their consum well below their competition. And they do so by following a direct to consumer model, completely bypassing traditional wholesale channels. Now from the get go, things move very quickly for greats. By mid August, the brand had a beta commerce site up and running and immediately began selling a pair of sneakers every 90 seconds. And in under 100 days, the brand had fully sold out of their first run inventory. Now what's most interesting about this to me is that Ryan and his team did this without spending a dime on marketing. Instead, they relied completely on using practical and forward methods for customer acquisition and converting sales. Now, as ridiculous as this sounds, the great story is actually a really great one, and I'd like to invite Ryan out to tell, talk about it. Welcome, Ryan Babazian. What's up, man? Hey, everybody. You got a lot of people here, and I want to hear your story. Man, dude, thanks for coming out, everybody. So, I think before we get into talking about Blue Rates, I think a lot of people would like to probably get a little background on where you came from and what you've done. Uh, I know that your history was as an agent, and I'm really curious, like, how did you get into footwear from there? Yeah, it was, it was an interesting trans bah, transition. Um, I'd worked in Hollywood, started my career at ICM, which is kind of one of the big agencies, and, and then became a manager. And while I was a manager, there was this kind of new thing happening, you know, product placement in film. And I was representing some, some urban talent and... Streetwear was really interested in trying to figure out how to get into film and have, sure. you know, these types of actors wear their products. And so I the, started. Who were the players back then? Which players? Like who, who was Streetwear? coming to you? Yeah. Uh, Mecca USA. Sure. Echo, um, that kind of that kind of genre, and Mecca was one of my clients. I became a cons a consultant to Mecca, trying to integrate the Mecca product into the kind of urban film lifestyle, um, urban lifestyle into film, right? And it, it, today it's really common practice, but back then it was pretty revolutionary. So that's, that's how I started my transition out. And um, I stopped working in entertainment in 2001. I mean, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah, but at, from there, I went on to become the head of entertainment marketing at Puma to kind of apply all those things I had learned representing talent working with brands and integrating them into film and TV and getting them on the backs of, of celebrities. And I built that department out in LA. Sure. And you know, out of curiosity, it's been a long time since that, but what was marketing like back then, outside of film, outside of that placement for brands? I, I mean, like it, was, it was the early days of the internet, and it was super analog. So you had like, you know, you're, you're, you, what you tried to do was get product on the back of a celebrity who showed up in Us Weekly. That was like getting on the cover of High Snob. You know, that's what it was. Sure. So not that easy, you're saying? Um, no, it wasn't easy, but it was, it, it was time. It took a lot of time, right? Because you had to get the physical product to the person. It had to be shot. It had, or the person had to wear it, be seen out in the market. Um, so today, it's very different. Today, sure. we can do it almost instantly. Now, did you come to those brands, both K-Swiss and Puma, out of like a love for footwear? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been in... I've been a fan of footwear since I was probably seven. Um, yeah. I mean, my dad was a high school gym teacher, and his uniform involved changing his sneakers every day. So from that age, I kind of, I thought everybody's dad had 20 pairs of sneakers sure. in their closet. And from there, I just became, I was never a collector, but I was certainly um, a, a consumer of, of, of sneakers. Right. When... When you look at today's market compared to then, uh, was there an ease back then compared to today? I don't think it was easier. It was, it was just different, you know? Like, 
it wasn't any easier. It, I think today is actually easier. Sure. You can, you know, it's, it's pros and cons. There's good and bad on both sides of this. As a marketer, you can actually gain traction globally almost for free. Right. Um, there's very, very little overhead in getting a digital image distributed widely. Um, back then, it took a little bit of, you know, elbow grease and heavy lifting. Sure. And we'll get deep into that in a second. Yeah. But let's, let's get right into greats, because I think most people here really want to hear that story. You guys have been uh, incredibly successful in a market that's full of uh, a lot of brands that are going direct and consumer. In fact, I have a quote here from um, WWD, where they say that the direct to consumer efficiencies of e-commerce have become the go-to business model of many a fashion startup. Do you agree with that? Yeah. It's, it's easy to launch an e-commerce site. It's hard to sell stuff. It's, you know, getting somebody to convert from another brand, a legacy company that's been around for 40 years, and spend their hard, hard-earned money on your product, whether, whether you're making sneakers or T-shirts or eyewear, sure. that's not easy. So, frankly, the, the easy part is getting a website up. The hard part is building a brand affinity around your actual product. Right. Right into it. What made you start grades? The market was ready. I mean, the, 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 the wholesale model, whether it's footwear or anything else, is completely broken. And it's really inefficient. And ultimately, the inefficiency is passed on to the customer. And the customer is sure. paying an inflated price that they don't need to. Um, we certainly weren't the first ones to pioneer this model. I right. mean, we, we were watching Warby. And we we're like, wow, you know, they're doing this for glasses and they're doing an incredible job. Why hasn't anybody done this for footwear for right. me? Right? That, that was really the inception and the, the kind of drive that kept bothering me. Like, you know, we know everything about footwear. We know how to market footwear. We know sure. how to design it. Like, why aren't we doing this? Sure. And uh, we finally just jumped. How, how long did it take you from the idea to, I don't know, coming up with a name to actually launching that first commerce site? So John and I had the like the idea had been floating around in, in the conversation for probably two years. Sorry, and John Buscemi, my co-founder. But from the time we were like we're going to do this, and we actually put something down on paper, we raised money in about four weeks. We both quit our jobs. From April, we didn't have a bank account, a name. So that happened in April. By August, we had a site up, and shoes were selling. So it was, it was, once we decided to do it, it was, it, it was really fast. I remember, I remember the first outreach or, or um, interactions that I had with greats, and they were, quite frankly, unlike any other brand interaction I had at the time. I think it was actually a direct email that I probably received from you or John at the time. Uh-oh, sorry. Uh, really uh, addressing me, quite frankly, and I'm sure you were addressing hundreds of other people and I found that I found that quite compelling, actually. It wasn't, you know, there was it wasn't really so much about the uh, a form mail as much as it was about you guys really introducing what you were doing for us. And I'm I'm curious to know, you know, how much time did it take to do all that outreach? Oh God, I mean, I when we were launching, we didn't do anything. I mean, we were splitting hours between East Coast, West Coast. I was up at three o'clock in the morning in my underwear on on the couch, like responding to customer questions. Right. It was a twenty four seven, seven day a week, complete junk show. Like John and I were just beside ourselves. Yeah. But you know, that's what you do. But that, that's what you have to do. There was it was just two of us. We didn't right. have one employee. It was just the two of us. Yeah, that's what you have to do. And, and, and for the people out here, you know, what was going through your head? Because you, you have a lot of experience in marketing, you know, very successful in it. What were kind of the, the standout things in the beginning that you knew you had to do to make this successful? We took an early bet on Instagram. We just felt like it made the most sense from a visual standpoint to actually position a brand and tell a story. And uh, we really focused all our energy around that because we didn't have any money to, to market we couldn't we didn't have a budget right. so we felt like if we can build Instagram and then we can go out and get our friends in the industry to kind of tell the story with us when we launch maybe we can you know make make a sale right and you you guys had a lot of followers really quickly yeah we posted our first picture May 6th by 
May 8th, sorry, by August 6th, which is when we launched, we had 10,000 followers. And the photos that you were showing at that time were, was it product-based? Was it more uh, inspiration or aspiration? We didn't have a product. We didn't even have a sample. So for the first 100 days, we showed pictures. All right, so you basically built a brand with no product, built a loyal following about 10,000 users on Instagram without ever showing a damn product. Yes. <laughs> okay. True story. What was the first shoe? Uh, we had two. We had the Royal and the Wilson, um, which we, you know, they're legacy products at this point. Uh, Royal was our, we kind of looked at the consumer market and we said, okay, we're going to launch two styles and they're going to serve two different groups. One is kind of entry level, $59 vulcanized canvas shoe. The other is going to be a made in Italy luxury shoe. Sure. Um, which at the time was only $100 because our first Royal, just a little quiz note, we were making it in Mexico. Um, and Mexico actually makes really good product. It wasn't a question of like, is this good or not? We got, we launched and then we realized these guys aren't gonna be able to scale with us. Like this is a disaster. These guys are gonna be like. What do you mean, was it, was it like a delivery issue at that yeah, time? Yeah, there was a lot of issues. There okay. was a whole bunch of issues going on with the Mexican factory. Got so it. we just quickly, and this is like the startup thing. You have to just make a decision, point and shoot. Right. And we decided we're going to Italy. The cost will go up, but we're going to make a, like, the product will be better. And right. we'll then really be able to say right. this is a luxury sneaker. Right. That's a pretty, that's a pretty demanding change, right? To be able oh, to yeah. flip on a factory that quickly. You just got to, in startup world, like, everything moves, like, really fast. So... I think a lot of startups fail because they take too long to make decisions. Um, you've got to trust your instinct and really just, we knew, we, just, we knew that it was gonna, like, we're gonna put ourselves in trouble if we don't get out of this situation immediately. And thankfully we were selling out of things, so we had this kind of, hey, we're out of product anyway, now's the time to regroup. I'd love to, I'd love to know about like, what that first launch day was like, because that's always the most, uh, the <laughs> where, most interesting. Is John here? John, are you in here? Yeah. Okay. John is here. <laughs> <laughs> we launched, and our product was held up in customs. So we didn't ship... I thought we had a NAFTA agreement. We do have a NAFTA agreement, but when you're a new company and you're importing anything from anywhere, they have a little more scrutiny. Okay. So not only did it get a hold up in customs, it got held up in customs for 10 days. So for two weeks, we're selling product, like, really fast. And then there's no product shipping because it's not even in the warehouse yet. Wow. It was, it was tough. It was really hard. Like, we were like, you know, we were being honest. We were super transparent, um, which is all you can do. Don't lie to your customers. You know, you have to tell them what's going on. Sure. But it was, it was hard. You just continued to communicate throughout the whole thing. The entire time. We never stopped. And, right. you know, I think, fortunately, we had a super tolerant audience that really embraced our failure because it was a failure. Logistics, it was a failure. And they never left. Like, some of those guys have bought five or six pairs at this point. Sure. How many people have bought something on Kickstarter that they have yet to receive? Okay. So that's an, exa that's an example of, of what not to do, right? Yeah. I mean, look, we didn't plan on doing it. Like, there, sure. there are things that happen right now, and we have a pretty tight logistics team. It's, things happen. Sure. You know, you're shipping product in an airplane overnight from Italy. Some, something happens, it doesn't show up, and it doesn't turn around as fast as you plan for it. It's just... You know, the, the good people get past it, right? They figure out a way to, sure. to, to, to continually close those pain points. Decision making is quite important throughout this process. And, you know, as you said, you know, you make mistakes and you're really honest with your users. Um, I wonder if you have any advice to folks out there in terms of like, you know, how, how you, just, you just go ahead and you keep, you keep pushing along and ensuring that things keep running even when shit hits the fan a little bit. I mean, it's, it's definitely, I think entrepreneurs have a special thing where they figure it out. Um, startups are not for everybody. Like, it just, I have some friends, incredibly smart, like way smarter than me, like guys that went to Harvard. They're starting companies and they suck at it because they're so analytical and they're living in this kind of uh, business plan world where the real world just isn't like that. Like, you have to... You have to make decisions, and you have to either pick a direction, and if that doesn't work, reroute. Like, but it's it's constant iteration, 
That's, that's what a startup really is. It, there's no end zone. Collaborations you guys have been really strong around. You've done some fantastic ones. You've got actually a ton of coverage from, from New York Fashion Week to, uh, to Milan and to Florence and beyond. Uh, the re those are relationships that you guys have had. Uh, I'd, I'd love for you to just talk about the importance of those collaborations in helping um, grow the brand. I mean, we've been really fortunate with the collabs, but I think having been in the industry, we understood how it worked. We had a lot of relationships. Not all of them are people we have known. Um, we don't do collabs for collab's sake. It's, it's got to have a meaning and it's got to have a purpose. Um, I think we've been really selective, but really fortunate at the ones we have done. And the most recent and most successful was not somebody we knew. Uh, it was with Marshawn Lynch from the Seattle Seahawks. And, and he reached out and said, hey, I want to do a collab. I love what you guys are doing. You know, that, that shoe sold out in 59 minutes. And we're going to do another one on Black Friday. Wow. You know, that, that wasn't a relationship that we had. That was just a, a, a fan of ours who wanted to do something that his audience could buy, like a, a luxury shoe that his audience could actually afford. And, and it worked out really well. You know, and Marshall's a guy that can, quite frankly, pick up any shoe he wants, right? Yeah, I mean, these guys, we have an interesting group of fans, and these guys can buy whatever they want. Um, we're lucky that they think Greats is cool. What is it about the brand that you think uh, transcends price point, really? Because you do offer an incredibly affordable shoe. You guys make, your, you make a, a, a fair amount of your product in uh, fantastic factories. Um, but yet you're still, you're attracting uh, a consumer that can certainly pay well above that price. I, you know, I, I think we, we're really good at blending the soup of like fashion, sport, blogger. You know, we kind of have an interesting mix of collabs that serve different audiences. And, I, and, and when you do that well, I think you build a brand affinity across a wide range of, of customers. And at this point, it's about education. You're right. A lot of our customers can go out and afford a $500 sneaker. But why would you if I can give you the same exact quality, same Italy, same leather, same sole? Why? You know, that's a question for an individual. I, I don't know. I think, I think we're building an incredible brand, and we're offering premium for value. And I think that's the most compelling thing of our business. I think that's what we set out to do, and that's why we're scaling the way we are. You talked about ideation earlier um, and being able to flip the switch on factories. I, I want to get a little bit more into the specifics of how you go about um, ideating across other parts of the brand, be it from, well, let's, let's just get right into it, the marketing. Because you, within those first 100 days, and for quite some time, you really didn't spend a drop of cash in marketing. Yeah, in marketing we, I mean, we really didn't start spending money till this year, and we still don't spend that much. Um, I think the two most powerful things you can do as a brand is have great word of mouth and great PR. And PR comes in a bunch of ways now, right? Like PR on High Snob is equally as valuable as print and GQ, maybe more, right? Thank you. You're welcome. Send me the check later. <laughs> um, no, but really, like you get you get a digital asset, and then the what what you do is you amplify it, right? Like we're if we get something in High Snob, we're making sure that everybody knows it's in High Snob. Maybe we'll send it in an email. We maybe we put it on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Right? That's we want to educate the market. Like this shoe was just written about in this place, and when you do that, you're setting this kind of tone of 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 being a brand that's meaningful. We're young. We're super young. We, most people in the world don't know us. So we have to tell that story over and over and over. Sure. To, in, in looking at uh, the landscape today, um, there, there, are plenty of, uh, there are plenty of options, as we said. Um, when it comes to really looking forward and in trying to understand how to best acquire new customers, because at the end of the day, that's really what we want to do. You want to acquire... I'll let you speak to this, but I mean, you want to acquire loyal customers that keep coming back to you. In the two years since the brand has launched, can, can you think of anything specific that you've changed and how uh, you're trying to reach those customers? You know, honestly, it's so early. We're not, I don't have a set answer for you, but 
um, we did just do a beta test with Instagram, and I can speak to that being kind of the most compelling channel for, for customer acquisition for us, because I think what we do on Instagram is super native, right? People understand it. And then we're just giving you an option to buy the shoe, right? Like that channel of distribution, people are like, oh, it's an ad, don't, don't advertise to me. And all I think differently, I say, hey, you like our shoe, you wanna buy it? This is the easiest way to do it. Right. Don't click the button, don't like right. it, pass right over it. But if you wanted to, it's there for you to do. And, you, and I, we're, I'm just trying to ease the access to the customer. That's why I would do it. And that's why I think it really worked. Sure. Um, but I'd say that's the most compelling one we've seen so far. And you're, you also follow, you're also doing the same thing on Twitter because I've seen just today yeah. a bunch of uh, promoted posts, as they say, on Yeah, we're platform. doing it on all of them. And right. I think that there's a new channel of distribution opened up, opening up. Social commerce to me will be the next biggest, not the next biggest, it will be the biggest channel of distribution for everything. Right, right. I think we're closer to the market because we happen to have a 100% millennial male customer who's mobile first, right? Like everybody in this room lives on their phone, right? All of our customers happen to be iPhone customers. I'm not saying that as an Apple pitch. That's just a fact. The, the truth is people buy on iPhones. Correct. So now you have these social ch social channels with these buy buttons in them, right. and I think that's the future of our business. So let's talk about not that. Not just greats, but anybody that's selling anything. Sure. So high snobiety, you know, we, we were a blog first uh, 10 years ago, and Ryan and I talk a lot about this. In fact, we just talked this morning a little bit. Uh, we tend to bounce a lot of ideas off each other. And in thinking about launching a brand today, um, you know, what's more important? And I think I know what the answer is. Is it, is it pushing a social hit or is it posting a, or pushing on a blog post? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think they're complementary if I'm going to answer it the way I, w I want to. I think that it's not one or the other. I think you need a matrix of marketing to come together. Social's one. Blog post is another, uh, celeb not celebrity, but influential sure. ambassador. Those are all really critical for building a brand. I mean, if you do that in repetition, then people are going to start to pay attention to you, and then people will actually start to convert. One, one of my favorite photos we ever got from a customer was like month two. We get this photo of a guy's closet. It's about 30 pairs of Nikes and one pair of grades in the middle. And he wrote this really compelling email. He's like, you know, every pair of shoes I've bought in the last 10 years had a jump man or a swoosh on it. And you're the first pair I bought. And I'm really happy I did. And sure. like, that's a huge thing when Absolutely. a customer converts like a lifelong loyal customer from some other brand to your young baby brand. Like that's, that, that's what makes this fun. And the, I mean, the, I, I've had a belief that there is a, there's a, a real big change happening in footwear. Uh, with brands like yours and others coming up that are offering a, a very compelling alternative to Swoosh and to Three Stripes. Um, and the con they're not making the same exact connection that you are to your customer. And I, I, I feel that those other brands are, quite frankly, something that's super hyped and that everybody in this room wears. But when it comes to brands like Grey, it's a different kind of connection that's being made with the brand. Yeah, I mean, you, it's, it's what you get when you're vertical. We're directly connected to the customer, right? These guys, the majority, the legacy brands, which I, you know, I've, I've worn my whole life and have friends working at every single one of them, they're just older. And the majority of their revenue and sales is coming from a third-party retailer, right? So they have this disconnect from the customer in the way that a vertical brand does not. And... Frankly, I, I don't understand how you can launch a brand today any other way than the way we're doing it. That, I, I really don't. Like, the retail business is so broken that, you know, what, people used to dream about getting into Barney's, and now it's like, yeah, you get into Barney's and you hope you get paid, right? No, no disrespect to Barney's. It's not a Barney's issue. Every retailer in the world is on sale almost every week. That shows kind of the misalignment with, like, where the prices are, what the customers are willing to pay, and... We don't want to be part of that business. Phone numbers or email addresses? Which one is more important? Huh. And before you answer well, that, like, before you answer that, how many people in the room have a brand of their own? 
Okay, so a fair amount of people. And how many of you guys have newsletter lists? How many of you guys send an email at least once a week to your newsletter subscribers? That's, Only one? I see two, two? and John doesn't count. Uh, uh, talk okay, a, talk yeah. a bit about that. So email, I think email is in trouble um, for a couple of reasons. So the, to answer your question, text, right? So we ran a test, not a test. We now receive more cell numbers than we do emails, not because we only give you that option, because that's what guys would prefer to do. And with email filter filtering as aggressive as it's becoming, I think the marketing channel for email will continue to decline, and the faster that any brand can get to collecting more cell numbers sure. is, is the way to go. Right, Ryan actually put it one way really interesting to me. How many of you guys get newsletters that you don't open? Everybody. Every day, yeah. right? <laughs> When's the last time you got a text message that you didn't read? And that, to me, yeah. is... We have a 100% open rate on our, on our text. 100%. Now, that doesn't mean everybody clicks through. Sure. But everybody sees it, right? So that's all we're trying to do. Like, hey, this shoe's on sale. Or not, not on sale, but this shoe is out. You and, can go buy it. And this is a conversation that's been happening uh, quite often uh, within the space today. In fact, we, I just shared a, a Business Insider article to you yesterday talking about messaging in general, not just SMS, and how there's an incredible amount of uh, commerce and uh, service activity happening there. Uh, a great example of it is if you're on WhatsApp, I believe there are applications or companies out there that allow you to book vacations as an example. I'd love to, you, I'd love to just hear more about why you feel like messaging is there. Or the future. It, well, it's really simple. I don't have my computer with me, but I have this. Right. right. So everybody in this room has their phone on them. Bandwidth is at a place now. Bandwidth on your phone is just as good, if not better, than it is in your house. And you carry that thing with you all day long. So if you're going to send some sort of communication, whatever it is, it's more likely that you'll get it on your phone and actually open it, and text being the way to do that. Because everybody in this room filters emails. Our, the way we've been programmed is text is more immediate, right? You want to get an answer from your friend, or your right. girlfriend, or your wife, you text them. You don't email them, right? So we've, we've, there's been 10 years now where people just don't look at emails, and that's going to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. So from a, again, as a marketer, I look at the most immediate way to get, get traction on awareness is through a text message. Right. Thankfully, our audience is perfectly matched with that experience. If we were selling to 50-year-old women, that would not be the case. But our guy is millennial. They all have an iPhone. They all prefer texts. And we see success there. Or you'd be in Red Book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Marie Claire. Social media, especially the Instagram platform, is one that's never really allowed you to exit the platform, right? For, for, for years, you couldn't really link out of Instagram except for that description, the description link up there. And the, Facebook is very much you know, along these same lines. They'd rather you stay within that ecosystem. Um, back to the conversation about targeting within uh, Instagram specifically, talk to us about the kind of success that you're seeing there. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we were fortunate to be in the beta test for Instagram where you could put a picture up with a click to buy button and it took you to our site. The success we saw around that was the best success we've ever saw seen out of any ad we've ever run on Facebook or Twitter or Google. Um, I, I think that's, what we're gonna, that's where we're moving towards, not greats, but I think that's where the market is going to shift to and again, it's on a mobile device, right? Like Twitter, you started when you, it started as a desktop tool and later became more mobile. And Facebook, same thing, desktop, more mobile later. Instagram was automatically mobile, right? So your entire experience with, you still, to this day, you can go on Instagram on your desktop, but it's not nearly as good as your mobile version. So that experience and our audience being mobile first, mobile natives, that is, to me, the next great way to market. Right. But you have to have a product and a price that matters, right? Like, it's not going to sell cars. It's not going to sell Coca-Cola. It's going to sell items that are priced at a certain price that 
are meaningful to the audience that it's convenient to buy. It's about, it's, at the end of the day, it's about the customer and what they want, right? I don't, I'm agnostic to the channel. I don't, I don't have any investment in, in Instagram. But if that's where guys want to be and that's where they want to shop and that's where they want to spend their time, then, then we'll, we'll be there. There'll be another one. There's always another one in social. We just don't know what it is yet. But I can right. guarantee you that there will be another one. Any insight you can give for young brands um, who may or may not be direct to consumer uh, in really continuing to push brand awareness and acquisition? I mean, I think the brand principles of building a brand apply regardless of the type you're, you're building. So, you, you know, have a clear message, understand what you stand for, and don't waver from that. You know, a lot of brands try to be like everything to everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. And by doing that, they dilute their value, right? We are focused on men. We, we get emails from women that literally kind of yell at us, right? So What do they say? Why, why don't you make shoes for women? Don't they know they can size down twice and get the, get the product? So we took two styles and made smaller sizes, but only two styles. But the point is, we don't know shit about the women's market. I, I don't know how to make women's shoes or how to market to them ever at all. So Understanding your customers quite important. This is there. what we know, and this is what we're good at. Does that mean we'll never go into women's? I'm not saying that, but... At this stage in our business, we're very, very focused on a very specific customer, and that's part of our brand. Right. Um, yeah, I'd love to know personally like, what's coming next from Gray. It's not so much from a, a product standpoint, but in terms of you know, how the company's growing, and you know, what do you see as success benchmarks? Or benchmarks of success, excuse me. Well, I mean, we're going to open more stores. So we opened our first store in Williamsburg like a month ago. And we'll open more of those. Um, retail, this is where people might get confused. Retail works, right? It's a great way to experience a brand. Um, it's the best way to experience a brand. We just think having the vertical part of it where we're not relying on a third party retailer to, to sell our product, to merchandise our product, is the way for us to go. So we'll open more great stores. That's definitely on the playbook for next year. Um, we need to get better at mobile. You know, we are on a mobile, we're on an e-commerce platform that doesn't allow you to store credit cards, right? Which is a best practice at this point. So we're kind of behind, or this platform is behind. So it's really inconvenient. You still have to put your credit card information in. That's, that's a drag, nobody wants we're, to do that. We're getting at is the importance of that quick conversion, right? The amount of time it takes somebody to go to a page and It's hit. about convenience. Like, I don't like doing it, and I'm sure nobody in this room does. So the faster we can get to the best practices of mobile conversion, the more happy our customer. At the end of the day, this is about the customer, right? This is not about get them out of the checkout really fast. This is about don't annoy our customer, right? Like, give them an, an experience that's the best in the world. And that's what we're working on, which takes forever. It's never ending, let's just say that. Ryan, I love talking to you, man. You've always got something great and uh, amazing success. Congratulations on what you guys have been able to accomplish with greats. It's just, it's just fantastic. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, I'd love to open it up for questions, and I really want questions here. Uh, wondering how you guys came up with the name. Great question. Um, we did the typical brand exercise. We were writing names down, you know, drawing little acronyms and trying to figure it out. And the name, the idea of the brand, quite simply, was where the design thesis was we're going to pick the greatest silhouettes in the men's footwear space and design our DNA into it. And so this, that idea kept sitting at the top, and then these names would come and get crossed off. And then we just said one day, like, why don't we just call it Great? What was the second best name? Shit, I don't, there was no second best, was there? There wasn't. That was the greatest name. Then we went to get the URL and the guy wanted, fi no, 30 grand. So <laughs> we were like, is Greats brand available? Next so we, best thing? So we, so we did that. Yeah, but on that note, but we did, well, now we own Greats, we uh, bought it. How important, if you're starting out, like, how important is it to like, do a land grab against your name? Like Greats versus Greats brand. At the end, of, it, does the, doesn't the Google ecosystem eventually just find you? No. No? L listen, if you can have a name like Greats, let me put it this way. The value of our name for what we paid for it is 5x more. I could sell the URL 
for five times what we paid for it. Based on based on what you've been able to do with that name right. at this point. I could right. you would like I'd pay you to take great Because Heist in the Body is really worth nothing. It's just the most ridiculous name possible. No, it matters a lot. Like there's a lot of sophistication in in the way that people search sure. shoes. Sure. And if you search men's shoes right now, Greats comes up first. That's insane to me. I had nothing to do with that. Where's Wani? Is Wani Lee here? One one of our guys, one of our, our uh, digital marketing guys, that's what he does, right? So he's, the way we tag shoes, the way they get searched, how, sure. we, how we position and, them. And folks are familiar with this, that a brand can go out there and uh, really, if, with, with authentic, authenticity, you can really um, move your name or your content up the Google chain or the Bing chain. But you can also purchase against that a bit. Yeah, but, but nobody wants to purchase our name because they don't sell it. So right. if we had distribution across 100 different stores, they would be bidding on our, on our name. But we don't. So we have, that's actually a competitive advantage for us. Sure. Nobody's going to bid against our name. We have an organic search value, so that puts you up at some point to the top. And that's what we... All of our search is organic. Um, hi. Ryan. Hello. Uh, I'm Salama too. That's my son, Khalil. What's up, man? My, my question is, you are a young company, and it seems like I feel like you're getting respect because you respect your consumer. That's how I feel as a consumer. Um, my question is about, there's a lot of kids who are really, there's a, a new wave of like a generation that are crazy about sneakers, sneaker heads, as you will. but. What, is there anything that you see your company doing um, involving the youth? Because I feel like they're, as far as their collection and sneaker heads, they're touching the surface of something. They could even go profounder and affect their entire, you know, environment by, like, do you understand my question? Is basically, is there anything that you see your company doing that is connecting with the youth? Because that's your, that's your future, like getting yeah, with them immediately. I, I do, I do you know? understand your future, um, and it's a really good point. We have not gone far enough down yet. Um, we kind of, we offer an intern's program, but it's for college kids, and we're very active there. Uh, I think the next phase of our business, and I think we're a little bit of ways, is, is kind of diving into like, the high school age, you know, there's a, it's a really slippery slope. We don't want to be um, looked, at, looked at as predatory. So until we can actually offer some sort of program or give back, uh, I don't want to just go out to a 17-year-old and try to get them to become a customer to, to just grow our business. I think we have to put some thought to how we engage with, you know, they're young kids. You know, we, we certainly don't want to take advantage of them. Um, but we will, we will get there. Um, in any business you start, it's all about location. Why Williamsburg instead of Soho or Meatpacking? Or... Yeah, good one. Um, I moved back from Santa Monica for this, so that shows you how important it is. Um, we thought Brooklyn was becoming and continues to become a uh, style curating, a style curation site, city. And basically... If, Anyone comes to New York now, they're going to Williamsburg to kind of see what's happening, see what's going on. Uh, you know, just two weeks ago, Double RL opened their store in Williamsburg. So it was about, that was like first. It was like, hey, Williamsburg has this style thing happening, so that's good. Then There's also an energy there. Great energy. Like really, really, really good stuff happening. But then we looked into it a little further and we're like, wow, there's never been a men's sneaker brand created, like founded in Brooklyn. Like everything in the world has come out of Brooklyn at some point. So we could be the first footwear brand or sneaker brand from Brooklyn. And our hashtag, born in Brooklyn, is like one of our most popular. Hi, um, I was wondering, you said you collect more cell numbers than emails, but I don't understand how, like on your site, where you collect them. So we have like a, a pop-up box that pops up and you can opt in to give us your email or cell number. Um, that's, that's where it happens. Are you not seeing it? I didn't get that. Also, I was, I was kind of wondering if trouble. I would like, if I signed, no, because I signed up for like notifications of if a shoe comes in stock like my size, because I'm obviously a small woman. Um, but like it's asking for my email, not my phone. So I was just kind of curious like when you do the texts and- It's, it's literally called sending. a light box and it pops up about 15 seconds after you've been on the site. If it's not f happening, there, that's some- 
<laughs> problem, but okay. <laughs> which happens from second to second. Oh, Leave the building and now. Sorry, my follow-up question. Another quick question was, I was curious, you said in the beginning you, as you were launching, you didn't have your marketing budget and you got your friends in the industry to tell the story with you. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, like who was helping you? How were they helping you? What did that entail? A lot of them are in this room. Yeah, I mean, uh, f fortunately for us, we had uh, we had worked in the industry already. We had some authenticity, and I think that we had enough peers at different editorial outlets that were supportive of, of what we were trying to do. To this day, press is the most important thing. If, if there's one page in the marketing book that's most important, it's press. We have a model that allows us to work with press more frequently than a legacy brand, the way we kind of update colors and styles. It's kind of on a bi-weekly basis, so, or bi-monthly rather. That allows you to keep top of mind. Like we're constantly being written about and, 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 and it's very organic. It's not like we're talking about press releases and changes in the company. It's just, you know, the Wilson has a new style, the Royal has a new color, you know, that, that kind of thing. So that's, that's how we do it. And it, it. If I can interject for a second, the, the importance of that organic, those organic pickups is huge, right? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if we weren't telling relevant stories, and that's what we are doing when you release a product, you guys would never talk about it. Like, you're not going to talk about stuff that nobody cares about, right? I think that the reason the industry is talking about it so frequently and it's been so supportive is because we're actually disrupting a $125 billion industry, and we're doing it with nine people out of Brooklyn. So amazing. That's, amazing. that seems like an interesting story Aside from the, yo, that Marshawn Lynch shoe is incredible. Like, I right, need to get right. that. Like, that's part of it. But the bigger part is we're totally taking on a giant. I'm wondering, uh, I get calls all the time from Yelp, constantly trying to get them to get me to pay to be listed highest. What do you do? I, I own a bar barbershop's. I'm also constantly getting pursued by Google to be listed. But I feel like, and I'm wondering what you think about this, when a customer sees a little ad icon, to me, that kind of seems cheesy. Just wondering what you think about that. I think you're right about the sentiment, but it can work. Um, we don't do a lot. We don't do any of that on Yelp. We have one paid word um, that we literally just started to using last week, and it's, a, it's an experiment. You know, we, we're willing to experiment with getting our product in front of a new customer. I don't know if it's going to work. It took us this long to even do it for the first time. Um, but, you know, you should follow your instinct. If you don't think people are going to be more likely to come to your shop because you have an ad on Google, then don't do it. Hi. Um, you talked about how you're going to be opening more stores, um, which seems to be a common theme when you think about all the really strong direct-to-consumer brands out there like Warby and Bonobos, et cetera. Um, can you talk about some of the benefits that, that's provided to the business, be it customer acquisition, be it consumer customer lifetime value, um, consumer experience, et cetera. Um, and if there's any kind of product categories or brands that if that strategy wouldn't work for. Do you work at an e-com country? I do. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> all, those, all those terms in there. Um, customer acquisition costs will come down with retail. So most importantly, it's about brand experience, right? You, you, can't, you can still tell the best story possible in a physical space. So that's number one, and that's why we're really doing it. But customer acquisition costs will come down because, you know, if you're on a really high traffic neighborhood and a thousand people come in your store every week, there's a good percentage of those that'll convert into customers that you no longer have to reach out to in a digital spend way. So those two things combined are, are really powerful, and, and that's why we're going to do it. I, I think from a product standpoint, like what doesn't work, um, I think it's about the, it, I don't think there's a nece necessarily a product that doesn't work, but I do think that weak brands will have trouble doing that, right? Uh, you know, if you, just because you open a store, people aren't going to walk in it. It's the same with e-com. People think, oh, build a website 
and people are going to just flood through the door. It, it doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of work and awareness to continue to get people to traffic your site, um, just like it does to get people in the store. Uh, so question is, uh, you said you and John uh, was this you two in early stages, and then a couple of months after you started your website and was selling product. How do you establish your startup so officially, so quickly, um, in that short period of time from capital and production and things of that nature? Spit, duct tape, and gum. <laughs> no, really, I'm not kidding. We, ah, shit, I don't really know. We, we were really, we, had, we raised money really fast, so that was luck. We had never raised money. We went out. I remember the day I said to John, I'm like, all right, I'm going to take a few meetings. We had like 10 pages on a deck. And I, I sat down for the first pitch meeting here in New York, and I'm telling our first, who became our first investor, I'm telling him our vision of why greats is this and what it can it be and how big the business can be. And I'm into the talk about 90 seconds, and he's like, great, where do I send the money? And I'm like, seriously? You're not expecting that? No, nobody does that. That never happens. I, we didn't even, I, I literally like looked up, I'm like, um, I have to open a bank account, I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> Swear, it's a true story. And from there, it, I, you know, it was a good idea. We had a lot of expertise. It, we weren't two business school guys saying, hey, where's the white space out there of you know, something we can disrupt? We were two sneaker guys that happened to hit the market at the time, but it's what we knew how to do. So I think investors were really comfortable with us because we knew our shit. Like we, you wanna know about how to market, design, position, we knew that. We didn't really know the e-com part, we didn't. Um, but we felt really confident that we could build something usable and hire a great team, which any company in the world that succeeds, it's, it, you have to have a great team. That's, that's that. And we've been fortunate with that as well. I mean, we've got some of the smartest guys I've ever met, way smarter than me, that work for us. Um, and that was just really fortunate. That was luck. That part was luck. I think it's more than luck. Uh, Ryan, congratulations on all the success, man. Thank you so much for chatting with us.